Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Medscape Live meeting. We appreciate your attendance and participation in today's meeting. Uh, my name is Robert, here to give you a little bit of information on how you can engage with today's content a little more. Uh, we're offering an interactive experience during this live event. Uh, a couple steps that you need to take to be able to see the content on your personal devices. Uh, you're going to want to connect to the ASH 2022 wireless network. The password is Medscape with a capital M. Uh, and then from there, you can scan this QR code that you see on your screen. That's going to bring you to a link in your phone's browser. Um, you're going to start by entering a valid work email address to begin the activity. And from there, you can view the slides. You can access all the content. You can save the slides and take notes on those slides. That information will be sent to you about three days after today. You can also ask and answer questions. We do have some polling questions today, so we would love to see you log in and respond to those questions. Uh, and also, my favorite feature is you can submit some questions up to our faculty here. They are eagerly anticipating your questions and would love to have a sort of conversation uh, going with this audience. So please submit as many questions as you can think of um, to kind of participate and join in on the experience. Um, if you need any help with that, I'll be kind of roaming around on the back of the room um, so you can raise your hand and I'll do my best to help you out. Um, but with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our presenting faculty. Thanks very much and enjoy the presentation. Hi, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining. Uh, I just want to echo, uh, we're really excited to have you here and um, we welcome your questions, but to not discriminate against the large virtual presence. Uh, there are, all the questions would be coming in online, so please have your phones ready, um, use the QR code and submit your questions, uh, and we really look forward to a very interactive session. So uh, we're going to be talking about the evolving paradigms in myeloma. I feel like every day we're adding new drugs, and, um, and it's hard to, how do you apply all of this data into the clinic? Um, so my name is uh, Ajay Chari, I'm a professor of medicine and uh, director of clinical research at the myeloma program at Mount Sinai in New York and let my colleagues introduce themselves as well. Hi, I'm Karina Patel, Associate Professor at UT MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. I'm Ajay Nuka. I'm a professor in the Department of Hematology and Oncology at the Winship Cancer Institute at Emory University. So we're also known as Karina and the Ajay shows. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so um, this is our agenda today. We'll talk a little bit about high-level approaching um, treatments, and then uh, Dr. Nuka will take us through the frontline therapy, We'll have some cases, then we'll go to the relapse setting, and Dr. Patel will have some cases, and then uh, Q&A. So what are the current challenges that we have? You know, I think, uh, we, I think we all have lymphoma envy in myeloma, um, and you can see that on the left side of this graph, follicular, DLBCL, Hodgkin's, there's this really nice plateau that they have. Unfortunately, myeloma, we don't have that plateau, and um, we want to try to get there, and I hope at the end of this session today, you'll see that I think we're making progress, um, but we probably need to do better. But definitely, things have improved since this graph was published in 2018. And so, um, in addition to the therapeutics, in oncology, we one of the reasons, obviously, it's a subspecialty in and of itself is we have to keep in mind patient factors, disease factors, treatment factors, particularly frailty and age in myeloma, renal dysfunction, um, and the disease, ISS, extramedullary. And then as we get to the relapse setting, the prior therapies, um, and something actually we had a recent meeting about, which is not on here, and we probably should add, is patient reported outcomes, right? So as our cho choices keep increasing, it's not just what we think about it, but what's the patient experience? And I, I need to update this slide. Um, but what are the unmet needs currently in myeloma and where uh, might new drugs need to be um, uh, doing better for us? Is the frail elderly, uh, persistent renal failure, high-risk disease by ISS, extramedullary, um, and molecular high-risk, and also multi-drug refractory, as well as functionally high-risk, those patients who may not be at baseline by the crystal ball method, not known to be high-risk, but they relapse very quickly. And so um, I alluded to kind of we're doing better, and if you look at the staging of myeloma, um, can we try to attain cure? Um, it's, it's the C word that we don't talk about in myeloma, but I think We've all had patients, um, and we're sharing in our program a list in EPIC, our EMR, of patients that have been off therapy for more than five years. And I think it's really exciting time to be in the field. But when you look at ISS, you have the stage one, two, and three based on albumin and beta two. 
we added in the um, LDH and fish for the revised ISS, and, and you might have seen this paper in JCO this year, revised to ISS, which not only includes the middle category, a middle panel, but also now includes 1Q. And what you're seeing here is those curves are now getting, at least for some patients, that blue line is getting closer and closer to what we saw in lymphoma. And then on the other extreme, we have still a lot of work to do for those high-risk patients. And how do we do better? Um, you know, when we have increasing improvements in our overall survival, endpoints are important. Uh, one thing that's becoming more and more discussed um, because of the difficulty not only following OS but also PFS is MRD as a surrogate. Um, it's not yet being used as a regulatory endpoint and maybe in our discussions we can talk about some of the constraints, but what this slide shows is that whether you look at PFS or OS, everybody benefits from being MRD negativity in terms of, uh, in terms of it correlates with better outcomes is the better way to say it. So whether transplant eligible or not, ISS stage, uh, fish, MRD negativity correlates with better outcomes. And how do we then convert that and take that forward? Because MRD shouldn't be just a one-time point, it's sustaining that, and whether it's by flow or next-gen sequencing. And another important part, um, which in some ways is similar to lymphoma, is that myeloma shouldn't, you know, we can't just look at the marrow, uh, we got to look at the imaging as well. You can have patients with uh, extra medullary disease. And I think just some other principles to keep in mind as we talk about our myeloma armamentarium are these concepts of attrition and diminishing returns. I think we've all heard sometimes when these new drugs get approved in advanced myeloma patients, people are reluctant to move them forward. And that's because, well, I know it works in advanced disease. I don't want to burn my bridges. Well, this data does not support that approach because, unfortunately, when you start off with 100% of patients in the graph on the left, we continually lose patients, and not everybody will be getting to a salvage option. And on the right, we have diminishing returns that your treatment duration keeps diminishing. And so, in spite of all of these classes of drugs, we know we haven't gotten a plateau yet. And in particular, I would say that the high-risk and frail elderly don't get to that end relapse on the graph on the left. So I think it's really important to use our most efficacious drugs early. Doesn't mean everybody needs every drug forever. We're not saying here quads for everyone forever, but get that disease under control and then try to keep it there. And so uh, when I started fellowship, we had two classes of drugs, steroids and conventional chemotherapeutics. And now we've had four more classes of drugs, IMIDs, PIs, immunologic approaches, and XPO. And I think the immunologic in particular requires a little bit of expansion. And, and I always like to remind folks that the Nobel Prize in the 80s was uh, for antibody development. It's actually due to a uh, fusion of a, a myeloma cell uh, with a, a, a splenic cell. And I think every human antibody is actually due to myeloma. And fortunately, uh, 30 years later, we got naked antibodies. We have three of those, uh, two targeting CD38, one targeting CS1. Uh, we have an antibody drug conjugate, belantamab, which has a uh, kind of a complex story that Dr. Patel will get us into. And then two CAR-Ts and a bispecific antibody that just got approved. So this immunologic category is getting increasingly um, rich and uh, more and more choices, which is exciting. And so then, where are we with myeloma? survival, and this just shows that um, we've had a lot of clinical trials to look at um, the role of either transplant or induction. So starting from the left to the right, the IFM um, showed RVD with or without transplant, no difference in OS, determination similarly, uh, calcitia and uh, was VTD transplant with or without DARA, and in Griffin with or without DARA. So the two curves on the left, the question was really transplant, the two on the right are really whether the induction should be changed. And I think the point of this graph is, first of all, as you're going from left to right, these curves are getting flatter. Um, and so even in the modern era of therapy, uh, we're, we're seeing flatter overall survival curves, and that's really exciting. Um, but this also raises the question of what should be the right endpoint. Um, and Dr. Nuka is going to talk to us a little bit more about that. But importantly, with um, you know, a lot of people are saying that if you didn't see an OS benefit, we shouldn't be doing this. And, and I'm curious to hear my colleagues take, because, you know, there's that joke, you ask three myeloma doctors, you'll get five opinions. So we'll see what they think as well. But um, with Griffin, you can see that the, uh, this is their VRD, uh, that PFS curve is also getting flatter. Um, and so that really is very encouraging. Um, and before we abandon the baby with the bathwater, this is our NCI SEER data from the U.S. because this data set, this type of data set has been done globally. 
But when you look at overall survival, um, first by different time periods, and those are the different colors shown in each panel, um, and you can see on the bottom right panel, for those patients over age 80, uh, between 1973 to 2009, exactly identical. No difference in overall survival. And this is despite thalidomide, bortezomib, and LEN being available in 2000. So in spite of those drugs, that last decade didn't really do much. And then as you work your way to the left, 66 to 79, we've seen some, some improvement. And then finally, when you're getting to the younger patients, that's where you see the improvement in OS. And I think the main difference here was really the role of transplant. And so my question then is, where's the proof? Um, where are the long-term data to show that novel regimens are not just as good, but better than transplant? Because everybody's in a rush. And this was an interesting discussion at our IMWG meeting, is whether we should be doing transplant or not, because there's no difference in OS. But I think one of the questions is, what should be the endpoint? Um, because yes, P PFS tells you the efficacy and safety balance. And the, the presumption is if that efficacy translates into OS, that tells you a lot. But the big confounding issue is access to salvage options and then the duration of follow-up. And to be using OS as a primary endpoint, I think it's going to be challenging. Um, and then just briefly, um, we have so many options. So we just did talk a little bit about newly diagnosed. But in the relapse setting, an enormous explosion of um, high-impact randomized phase three publications in, in the New Englands and the JCOs. And, and I think the community practitioner is probably going to be one, left wondering, what do I do with all this? How many, you know, you saw that table of drugs. Um, and I think in myeloma, our, our research has been going so quickly, we haven't been actually been able to keep up. The big question is now sequencing. Is there, what do you pick one after the other? And I think the purpose of this is we're now starting to get some hints that maybe class switching is supported. Um, the, the graphs on the left are all POMDEX backbone with the addition of a third agent. Um, and you can see POMDEX, we really needed this drug uh, when it was first approved. But the PFS as a doublet is about four to nine months. When you add a third drug, you do get about nine to 12 months. But um, the one thing that gets you 20 months is actually quadruplet. It's there are two mimaps, like a FOS9, DEX, and POM. So that tells us that I think, and, and these are in primarily lend refractory patients, which is a big deal. And on the right side of this, we see carfilzomib dex backbone, where now the control arm is giving you 15 to 19 months, and then the adding the CD38 is getting you uh, upwards of 29, 36 months. Um, and importantly, the lend refractory subgroup, which we got from Canberra, was 28 months. So I think um, Dr. Patel will tell us more about this, but the lend refractory we know identifies patients as poor prognosis and relapse. We know that it's a great drug um, and has OS benefits, but then it has downstream sequelae, which has ramifications. And then when for the triple class refractory, uh, you know, we have uh, 96 hour infusional chemo, salvage transplant, salinexor, the belantamide, which was recently withdrawn, I think an uh, important drug that had accelerated approval uh, strategy, but then the initial study, uh, although there was benefits to patients, did not meet the PFS benefit cutoff. And melflufin was also withdrawn. And it just shows that we have, um, even though we're trying to do these accelerated approval, we can't let go of the confirmatory randomized studies. Um, Iber is also looking really exciting. And what's really crazy is that historically, to get a drug approved in myeloma in this kind of unmet need was 20%. And uh, PFS about three to four months. And now look at what we're getting with these new immunotherapies. And on the left are the drugs, POM, CARF, DARA, CELI, with the PFS and DOR. And now we blow those out of the water with uh, even Belantamab, the DOR was 11 months, Teclisumab, 18.4 months, Idacel, 11, and Silpacel, not even reached. Um, so these, this is an unprecedented era, and it's really, I think we all have patients that we've talked about hospice that are now in stringent complete remission and the deepest remission they've ever had. And so my, I think, last point here is if we're doing better with these revised ISS2 shown in the middle panel compared to 2018, how do we go forward from this? What if we actually not just looked at the myeloma, but the immune and marrow microenvironment, extramedullary disease, renal failure, there's frailty, dynamic components, novel therapeutics, biomarkers. Um, if we put all that together, can we move away from just prognosticating? Because this ISS is great, but it doesn't tell you what to do with the patient. It just says who's going to do better, who's going to do worse. But can we get to a point where actually we can design individual risk-adapted studies, including discontinuing therapy, in some patients who are cured. I think that's really our, our challenge. And with that, I'll throw it over to Dr. Nuka. Great. Thanks, Ajay, for 
setting up the stage and, and giving us an overview of where exactly we were years ago and where we are today and what are the steps ahead of us. And I'd like to bring on, focus on that one aspect where I feel that there is a significant place for us to improvise on the, on the, on the treatments to gain those depths of responses and maintain those responses to, so that we can prolong this plateau. So to give a perspective, we have, clo we have close to 160,000 people that are living with myeloma. In my opinion, it's a gross underrepresentation. I'll make a point why. So we have 35,000 patients diagnosed with myeloma every year, which accounts to 1.8% of all cancers diagnosed. At the same time, we have 12,640 deaths, which accounts to 2.1% of all deaths happening from cancers. When you see the difference where the cancer death rates are higher than the incidence rates, so that means that we have a bar that we need to meet and we have not met there. So we got a long way to go to reverse that. So i show you examples that from data coming from our center where we use those three drug regimens homogeneously over a period of time where the average patients, the patient's lifespan is beyond the 10, 11 years mark and showing that if a patient is diagnosed at the age of 70, living till the 80s is, is a norm nowadays, and those should be the new benchmarks. So we made improvements, but we got a long way, long way to go. So where do we want to stress upon? So to give that framework, so let's talk about the transplant eligible patients, transplant ineligible patients. How do we get to those depths of responses? And the transplant eligible patients absolutely use the transplant after a good induction treatment and maintain that response with the maintenance treatment. So in the transplant ineligible patients, you do the same thing with a prolonged induction treatment. So what I show here as the PFS1 is probably the Achilles heel that I'm, I'm talking about. So you prolong the PFS1, which is absolutely half of a patient's lifetime journey, and you're able to show that extended translating to an overall survival benefit. I'll leave it managing the relapse part to Karina. So let's see where we are and how can we improvise the PFS1. So that's probably what's, what's going to be the, the crux of my, my talk. So there are two trials that I'll be talking about where the data has really shown the benefit of these two, two, uh, three drug regimens. Lenalidomide, Botas, and Dexamethasone from the IFM 2009 trial and the, I, and the determination trial. So IFM 2009. So this trial asks two questions. First one, can we delay the transplant to LA today? Number two, can we get away with a finite period of maintenance? So all the patients, the 700 patients we see are randomized to two arms. The first arm would receive RVD, the three drug induction regimen for three cycles, and the second arm would receive the same, and they, they would undergo a stem cell collection. And the non-transplant arm would receive five cycles of RVD as consolidation, and the transplant arm would receive a transplant followed by two cycles of consolidation, and both these arms would receive a finite period of maintenance for one year. So now the primary endpoint for this trial is progression-free survival. If you look towards the left lower corner, that's a PFS benefit for transplant, showing that patients who undergo a transplant have a PFS of close to 48 months, and patients who do not go for a transplant have a PFS benefit of three years. So there is a benefit of a year, and the transplant arm had shown that there is an increased MRD negativity rates, as you see towards a far right lower corner. And, as, as, and this is surrogate for the, the benefit of the PFS patients who achieve an MRD negativity, as Ajay has clearly showed before, that tend to get the longer PFS. So what you see in the middle column of the overall survival is where it is equivalent across both arms. So I would put this in a, in, in, in a different way. 80% of the patients who did not receive a transplant at, at an earlier time, at, a, at some time, received the transplant in the future. So it is an uncontrolled crossover is how I would look at this. So transplant is beneficial, and this study has clearly shown that transplant was able to deliver those benefits as we were looking for. So now, how about Determination. So this probably this is a trial that, that reflects our practice patterns in the United States. The only difference between the IFM 2009 trial and the determination trial is here the landmine maintenance is given until progression. Clearly, what you see here in the PFS benefit is a two-year difference favoring the transplant here again. 
So what I'd like to show you is the overall survival benefit at a median follow-up of 18 months. So I'm asking a provocative question here. So if somebody gets a good induction regimen, gets a first line of regimen, if the, if the PFS2 is probably in the, in the range of 90 months from the PFS1 and PFS2, and if you're seeing a median duration of follow-up of 80 months, and we're already making the decisions of whether to give transplant, is transplant beneficial or not, in my opinion, it is too premature at this point with, with, with that kind of follow-up. So this did not, this is a selective patient populations in the clinical trials is, is, is something that we all think, think about. What happens in the real life? This is our clinical practice where we treated 1,000 patients with RVD induction treatment, and the standard based, standardized patient having a PFS of 80 months is not uncommon. So these outcomes are, are what you're seeing in real life in your clinics with extended maintenance among these patients uh, who are getting good induction regimens. So where do we go next? So can we replace uh, Vortazumab with a more potent protein inhibitor? So what happens if you use Carfilzumab in the induction setting? So Forte trial is the one that asks three questions. First question, can we get away with giving cyclophosphamide instead of lanolidomide? The second question is, can we get away with the transplant? The third question is, is there a role for a combination maintenance? So three arms, the first arm was KCD, Patients would receive a transplant, patients would receive KCD for four fourth cycles, and this is after the second randomization, patients would receive KR versus R, or consumption uh, lenalidomide versus lenalidomide maintenance. So the second arm would receive four cycles of KRD, a transplant, and four fourth cycles of KRD as consolidation before the second randomization. The third arm is the one that receives KRD without a transplant and would go on for the uh, second randomization. So what you see here are, are interesting results after, after the randomization one. Every, every arm showing the benefit for the usage of an effective induction regimen using lenalidomide followed by transplant versus the K, uh, KCD arm with transplant or versus the non-transplant arm. These are statistically significant across all patients. This is more prominent in the high-risk patients and if you look, at, look more closely in the double, double hit patients, the patients still get the benefit with KRD followed by transplant. Now looking a little more closely after the second randomization, what is that that is helping these high-risk patients to derive those benefits? The standard risk patients, yes, are getting a benefit with, with, the, with the combination maintenance, but the high-risk patients, if, I would really emphasize you to look at the lower corner, that's the standard of care which is what we do in the clinical, in, in the clinical practice with lung maintenance, that is probably not optimal for these double hit patients and the high-risk patients, and that bar should be higher using the combination maintenance. So now, how about using quadruplets? We talked about the triplets, we talked about improvising the triplets, how about the quadruplets? So what you see in the red boxes are what, what we talked about in the prior slides, the RVD experiences. So what Griffin asked was, can we improvise on the depth of response by adding data to map? So the primary endpoint here is stringent complete response after the patients complete the consolidation. So patients would receive induction with RVD, RD, RVD, followed by a transplant, followed by two further cycles of consolidation, and patients would receive maintenance. The DAR arm would receive data maintenance, the LEN, LEN arm would receive LEN maintenance. So DAR arm would receive data plus LEN redomide. So what you see, see here are the initial surrogates in terms of the depths of responses. So at, after the two years of maintenance, more than 80% of the patients achieved a stringent complete, a, a complete response or better. Stringent complete response seen in 66% of the patients using data tool map. Now if you don't use the data tool map just with the lenalidomide, which is the right columns that you see, you see that response seen in close to 60% of the patients achieving a CR. So now if you put these in the perspective of what, what do these depths of responses mean in terms of the PFS? So I'd like for you to focus on the red curve, which is the RVD arm. This is the, this is the control arm that we had talked about in the IFM 2009 trial, in the, in, the, in the determination trial. Those are exactly the same numbers that you expect at the 48 month mark. What we're seeing in terms of the PFS benefit by adding data, if you 90% of these patients did not progress 
by addition of this data to map and continuing that maintenance for those two years. So very effective strategy, and they should be they should be giving us a lot of benefit in terms of looking at what are the long term benefits of that that we can get from these uh, optimal induction regimens using the CD38 antibodies. I move on to Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia is an exact reflection of Griffin. Griffin was a randomized phase two trial, but Cassiopeia is a, is a phase three trial. And here the question is exactly the same thing, three drug versus four drug regimens. And here, not everybody is as fortunate as us to have lenalidomide as freely available. So in, outside the US, telidomide is more used. So here the control arm is VTD and the experimental arm is addition of data to map for a phase three trial and here the primary endpoint was PFS again. So clearly the PFS benefit is favoring the addition of data to map and there is a clear suggestion that the overall survival benefits are seen and as, as we continue to monitor these patients as with longer follow-up. Now, can we improvise on these regimens? We talked about data plus VTD, we talked about data plus VRD. Where does data come in with using uh, Kurt-Fulsmap? So my colleague Luciana Costa did this trial with MASTER. This is an investigator tri in initiated trial and used a very effective induction regimen with data plus KRD for four cycles patients would receive a transplant. The trial had a very innovative design of stopping treatment or pausing treatment when patients achieve a desirable depth of response here at MRD negativity. So now let's talk about what happens post-induction responses with data plus KRD. And they, they were able to separate by, patients by the standard risk group, the high risk group, and the ultra high risk group. So if you look at the primary endpoint, which is MRD negativity at, at 10 to the power of minus five, it was achieved across all groups and even 10 to the power of minus six, six out of the 10 patients who are ultra high risk were able to achieve a MR, uh, an MRD based consolidation and at, at a 10 to the power of minus six. So achieving those depths of responses is feasible even among the high risk patients and with a effective induction regimen. So now, if you look at the follow-up, so I may not agree with the, with, with, with the trial design, given that there is some stoppage of these treatments or interruptions of these treatments given uh, across all patients. So those high-risk patients at the two-year mark started to drop down. At the two-year mark, almost six out of, of the 10 people started to drop down in, in, in terms of their uh, PFS benefit. So it may not be the optimal strategy for these high-risk patients. They might need continuous treatment, but uh, I would challenge that the standard risk patients still this is this is a this is an option to, to be considered in the long run. So now in the same lines, we have ESA plus RVD versus RVD. This is a randomized phase three trial, the GMMG HD7 trial, showing the benefit of the combination of ESA-tuximab in that front setting showing the, the benefit of MRD negativity in half the patients that were treated post-induction treatment. Very good effective strategies. So I know I've provided a lot of information here. So but to summarize, we see we started with RVD regimens as the benchmarks and what you see towards all the way to the right are just nothing but improved outcomes than what we had compared to the most optimal benchmarks. So now let's change gears to talk about the transplant ineligible patients. So if you look in the, in the, in the bigger picture, of the 30,000 people that are diagnosed with myeloma every year, so only 10,000 people get a transplant in the United States. So which means in the majority of the patients, a major chunk of the patients do not get a transplant. So these are all transplant ineligible patients. And when you talk about a transplant ineligible patients, these are not fitting into one basket. There are several flavors of transplant ineligibility, and these patients are quite different, as we can agree. So how do you treat them? And I also want to emphasize that the attrition rates with, with these treatments tend to be significantly higher. So you got one chance for these patients. You, you, used to, you, you get to use the best regimen up front. So if the second, for patients who are transplant ineligible, getting the second line of treatment is only seen in six out of, out of the time people. So there's a 40% attrition rate in these transplant ineligible patients. So now we talked about one thing that all these patients are not the same. So how do you separate these, these patients based on the fit or the intermediate or the frail, frailty status? So what you see here is the frailty scores 
we, we always joke about the, the number of frailty scores in our circles that there are more, more scores than the patients. So, but the, the more accepted one is the IMWG frailty score, which is, take, which is taking four different variables into consideration to, to segregate these patients into fit, intermediate, or, or, or frail staging. Why do we need to do this? Because this is prognostic. Can we make it more prognostic? So Antonio, I think almost six, seven years ago, was able to show that you combine the, the frailty scores with ISS staging, you make this more prognostic. So how do we use this and translate into, into clinical practice? So this is a modified version of what, what, of what we did, uh, what Antonio presented years ago. It is clearly to say that you don't need to follow these guidelines, but not all the patients are the same. Myo clinic, Myo trial has done this dosing, and every patient should, trans, who is transplant ineligible should be getting the same kind of a dosing. That is, the, that is not the take-home message. The take-home message is, based on the priority status, you've got to adjust those, those dosings, and, and there are some patients that may not be able to get a, a triplet regimen. So those are the patients where you need to make those dose reductions and use doublex as needed. So I'll present two trials in this context, three trials in this context. One is using the Revlimib Velcade Dexmedzone versus Velcade Dexmedzone uh, in the SWOG S077 trial. Here patients were randomized to receive the three drug versus the two, two, two drug regimen, which is, which is RD. And the first six months of treatment where the patients received the potassium were, was the intervention arm, and clearly you're seeing a survival benefit of more than a year by using, using the three drug regimens up front. So SWOG has clearly shown that the three drug regimens can be safely used in, in, the, in the patients who are not intended for transplant and could be an optimal regimen. So how about the Maya trials? So we all agreed that the two drug regimens are RB, are optimal. So how can we make an impact by the addition of data to map as a third regimen? So which is addition of data RD versus RD with a primary endpoint of PFS. And Maya trial has evaluated this and, and was able to show not only you see a PFS benefit, but you're able to see an overall survival benefit. And this is a huge, uh, a huge benefit or a, or, or a leap in terms of the expected outcomes for these transplant ineligible patients, where almost 60% of the patients at the six year mark still continue to derive the benefit from use, using the anti CD38 antibody in that front setting. So, also any trial, so compared data, addition of data to VMP, VMP is a standard of care outside the US, and again, for the primary endpoint of PFS. We are able to show that the benefit of the addition of data to map continues to extend both for the PFS and the overall survival benefit, similar to what we saw with the Maya trial. So to summarize, we have seen a significant benefit not only in the transplant eligible setting, in, in the transplant ineligible setting, we are able to show that the addition of those uh, the extra drugs for the botasmib, data to map, and uh, the, uh, the addition of exasmib in the Tomlin MM1 trial MM2 trial is also able to extend those benefits for these patients in the long run. So here is a meta-analysis of all the non-transplant trials. So there's a beautiful analysis that was put in looking at what is the optimal regimen that would give us the best safety as well as efficacy under the scatter plot and what you see towards the right most, right uppermost corner are the ones that probably are the most safe, safe and efficacious ones and what you see towards the left lower most corner are the least efficacious and the least safe, least safe regimens. So based on what we are seeing, those three drug regimens and the addition of data are falling towards the right uppermost corner. So this is very important for us to have a visual or a view of what exactly you, you, you get from efficacy and a safety perspective. So we have, a, we have an algorithm for the new, newly diagnosed transplant eligible patients. Most of the patients are, are, are stratified into high risk patients, other standard risk patients, and the treatment is aligned to based on the risk stratification. So to conclude, we do have a lot of novel induction regimens with using monoclonal antibodies, getting those depths of responses, which we have not seen before. So I would emphasize that maximize the PFS benefit is likely to deliver those long-term outcomes that we're looking for. And clearly, the frailty assessments need to be considered 
to make those appropriate dose adjustments or the regimens of choice for these, tra for these transplant eligible patients. So we heard a lot from the transplant eligible trials, transplant ineligible trials by the trial. How do you wrap, wrap your head around all these existing treatments and how to, how to translate this into clinical care is where we're talking about the case challenges in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. So I'll start with case number one so, and get opinions from, from my colleagues here. So case number one is a 65-year-old black woman presents with anemia and standard blood work. So as you can see, the hemoglobin is 7.2. That led to the workup, found that the patient had a free light chain ratio, uh, free capital light chains of 640 milligram per liter, and clearly this patient has a M protein of three and a half grams. On the bone marrow, standard risk features that were seen with deletion 13, hyperdiploidy, 60% clonal plasma cells. Yes, this patient fits the criteria for myeloma, and on the imaging, there were multiple osseous lesions. So the patient was staged at RAS stage two IgG kappa myeloma. Now, how would you treat this patient with newly diagnosed myeloma who is eligible for transplant? What do you think about these results, Karina? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Adara, bortezomib, Lundex, uh, so DVRD. I, I think in a standard risk patient who is young, fit, you know, had some comorbidities, but nothing that was really affecting her um, overall PS or, or other issues, um, this makes perfect sense from the Griffin study um, to do the quadruplet where we see the best upfront results. Absolutely. So. We are the, as we talked about, was the, was the baseline against which the other regimen should be compared. It's, it's, it's my opinion. Do you think any differently, Ajay? No, I mean, I think um, we have the test with PA with DARA VTV that translate to PFS and OS. And Griffin, it's a randomized phase two, which was not even powered to look at PFS. And already that is showing favorable results. And there's a confirmatory phase three study going on. So I think. Um, Everybody, I think it depends on how early or late adopter people are, right? Uh, it's interesting that VRD was adopted in the U.S. for a decade before any randomized phase three study was available. Um, and I think the question is how, how early will people adopt this? And uh, I think the key, one of the key things to also emphasize is when you're using these quads, uh, and I alluded to this before, uh, Griffin actually terminates DARA after two years, right? It's not DARA till progression, because I think to be comfortable doing that, we do need longer follow-up data, right? Because we know that uh, lens resistance, <clears throat> and I'm going to ask you guys, this, this was a question from the audience too, that lens resistance does have a downstream sequelae, but um, these are this discussion, how do you define lens resistance and, um, and would you use this also later? So is it, would, would any thoughts on that? For lens resistance or thera resistance? But both. Or, yeah. The, the, the so using I, of frontline therapy to progression right. with resistance is and a broader I question. I completely agree with you. I think in the past where we didn't see these amazing CR, MRD negative rates where patients can do really well um, without being on therapy, we, we had to do continuous therapy. And I think with these novel therapies coming in, immunotherapies, what are we doing to the rest of the immune system to help keep this knocked down, hopefully? Um, that's a big question, and I think for a patient, we talk about different reasons to treat, and, and patients, you know, what patients want. Um, if, if they don't need to be on this forever, they'd like to not have fatigue and some of the other things. So I think scientifically, it makes sense to, to hold, um, and we need more data to show that. Um, and if someone is on LEN or on there or on a PI when they're relapsing, even if it's a lower dose, I consider that refractory, right? Um, and, and, you know, the, the official um, time is 60 days within, um, but even a few months, I feel like if someone's been on it for two, three years, and they relapse within a couple of months or two, three months after stopping, I'm still a little worried that I wouldn't use it to retreat, 
but I do think there's some resistance there that might affect the next outcome. So lentil progression because of OS benefits and any pro any dose progressing on that, you're not really going to try to milk more out of it. But I maybe you could speak to the Dara part because Cassiopeia across the other side of the Atlantic was some controversy about if you use frontline Dara, what do you do with relapse? Thoughts on that? That's a great question. I think the way that I always look at the data VTD in, in, the, in the Cassiopeia trial is specifically that we did not know, number one, the, the dosing or the schedule of data to when the trial was initially, initially designed as well. So that is a, the, what, what was shown in the Cassiopeia is, yes, you could, you, you could salvage these patients who did not receive the data in the upfront setting, even, as a, even, an, even in the salvage, even in the relapse, so even post-transplant. So the arm that did not get the most benefit, at least benefit, that was the one that never received data at, at all. So that would be my take-home message. So number one, we didn't have an identified schedule, we didn't have an identified dosing, of data and the number of cycles that were received altogether, the number of doses that were received of data, if you combine before or after transplant, are exactly the same. So, yes, data is able to help us to push those uh, push to the PFS. But the the one strong take-home message that I, I can see is the the arm that did not receive data at all is the most inferior one. And I think just to flush that out a little bit, so the addition of DARA and DTD led to PFS and OS benefits in the context of transplant for all patients, but the deeper dive was what you just alluded to. But I think the two caveats I would emphasize exactly, one is the, the dosing, but the other is also the follow-up, right? So if you look at MRD negativity, the most MRD negativity was in DARA and induction and in maintenance. So I think we have to just look at the data as they are now. Um, and one thing where we should be using MRD is for these kinds of settings where you don't have enough follow-up. So I think we only have to see how the PFS matures and then also what Griffin uh, happens and then we have the confirmatory additional studies. So maybe we could um, tweak this same patient. Um, and I saw the Emory and, uh, algorithm, but so if this patient had been high risk, how would you guys have changed your management? Absolutely. I probably would switch that Bortezomib to Carfilzomib based on the master trial results that we had seen. So would I follow the same strategy or the study design as master? Absolutely not. But to get the depth of response, I probably would use the data plus KRD in this specific regimen. Yeah, I, I think if I can get the insurance to approve it um, without phase three data or phase, you know, major phase two data, um, I agree for us. We, we usually, as long as the patient's fit, we'll, we'll switch out the, the K and the V. Um, and um, maintenance, it's a double maintenance. Um, and right now, mostly PI for mid. Yeah, I think my only additional comment would be, First of all, outside of a clinical trial, we can kind of do what we want, right? You can start with V and switch to K. You can go from K to V. Um, I think that some of the challenges with the DKRV um, is we know carfilzomib is a great drug. I would say it's my preferred drug in the relapse setting, but it's a very interesting drug because it has many different doses and schedules, and partner drugs vary those things and the anticoagulation. And I think one thing I would just ask that people be um, aware of is that when you give carfilzomib with an image concurrently, Probably, I'm curious if you see, I, I wouldn't go more than 56 weekly um, because I think you're going to get more venous thrombotic issues. And, uh, and the problem is, I mean, we participate in the DKRD study, and when somebody, you give that regimen and they have a uh, shortness of breath, what's the problem? Is it pneumonia? Is it heart failure? Is it a PE? Is it anemia? Like, which of those is it? And, um, and then the last point I would make is, I think one of the, if you're going to practice evidence-based medicine, um, the endurance study was KRD versus BRD in standard risk. And that did not show a benefit of the addition of carfilzomib. <clears throat> now, um, name a drug in myeloma that has improved outcomes for high risk but did not improve drugs outcomes for standard risk. So I would love to see some data for DKRD um, with PFS and OS in a randomized setting um, not single arm studies. So I'm a little, I'm, I'm not, I think, for the patient who has neuropathy, and, and that's the other thing too, is that we do all of these studies are twice weekly, but the real world, no one's doing twice weekly of anything, right? Everybody's coming in once a week. So now you're actually asking, is 56 weekly of CARF better than bortezomib weekly? 
And then is it the cost? And actually, one of the other questions that came up here is, what would you guys do in the same newly diagnosed patient if your resources were constrained? Any responses to that? As you just alluded to, um, you probably wouldn't do VTRD because it's not going to get approved right, in many, many places, but it's very expensive and it's going to be hard to do. But any tweaks on this induction and transplant discussion and maintenance? So make, I think transplant there is actually the cheapest thing we can do for myeloma, right? So for sure those patients should go to, but getting them into induction, it, it depends on if when is, is affordable or not for that patient. But VRD, I would say minimum. Um, and, and I know people do cyborg when, when they can't get one, for instance, right? So I think in the end, that transplant piece is really what will get them hopefully into that deeper response, like a better piece. Yeah. So every drug that we have available, we're looking for the Dermadi negative state. What is the best way to get, like what is, the, what is that that will take us there? What, is, what gives us the best chance to take there? Use transplant, use all the drugs that are available. And if, 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 if any resource, second place we, where I only can get three drugs, I, I would use all those three drugs. I would not ration. Great. I think one other tweak, which actually relates to one of the audience questions as well, is we know that, um, unfortunately, especially perhaps in resource-constrained areas and also in some of the disparity work that's being done, unfortunately some patients' diagnoses are being delayed um, with additional organ dysfunction as a sequelae of that. Um, what would you do in a patient with significant renal failure, especially maybe even one, a dialysis patient, uh, what would your treatment be? Yeah, so I, I, I guess which situation, but for, for patients coming to see me, um, I would try to do the quadruplet, um, you know, as long as they're still uh, transplant eligible, because um, organ dysfunction doesn't necessarily mean that, especially uh, renal, um, and it's just making sure you're dose reducing, right, um, at the appropriate levels, and then dose increasing if it's really renal insufficiency and they're improving because you're treating their myeloma, bringing those doses back up. Just to clarify, which quad are you using oh, in the dialysis? Yeah, DVRD. DVRD. So, I would, I, well, dialysis versus just organ dysfunction. So, but so dialysis patients, so that's a the QA question from the dialysis. audience is dialysis, we'll say. Yeah, so then not so much. I, I go still start one, but I, it takes a while to get it, right? So that's where I do the D BRD, we've ordered it, but we start with the DVD part of it, and hopefully if the LEN um, that creatinine improves, then I can add LEN at the correct dose whenever I can get it. Um, but we know DARA and Ortezomib work really well in, in renal failure patients, right? And I think the Ortezomib especially, because it's a lot faster to get and probably yeah. cheaper than everything else. Absolutely. I would tweak it a little bit. So I want to understand what am I getting from the treatment that I'm giving? So what are my goals of treatment, number one? And the others, it is a hematological response. Here, I need a renal response as well. I want to make sure if this is all because of a delayed diagnosis leading to a kidney failure, I really have an opportunity for us to see that renal reversal. So again, goes back to the same principles. To take the patient for a transplant and at the same time use the most optimal regimens that we have existing that I can give at full doses that I'm confident that the patient will respond. So Len, for all the reasons that, that, that we hear, we make dose reductions with, with, with patient, for patients on dialysis. So I simply use thalidomide in this case where I don't need to make a dose reduction. And we do have data from Dara plus VTB with an intent to move forward to, with, to a transplant as quickly as possible. And we see good results with this. Great. Um, maybe just in the interest of time, we can just summarize for uh, this older patient uh, with newly diagnosed myeloma, hyperdiploidy, stage one. Um, I think you can see the features there. Uh, and, and I think this emphasizes the renal issue, right? The creatinine is 1.2 uh, in the 74-year-old female, but her clearance is 29. Um, let's get the audience's uh, treatment choice for this. folks are voting, I would just add to that last case, I think I would, one of my favorite expressions is time is kidney. Um, you have a narrow window of time to reverse mm -hmm. acute renal dysfunction, which is typically due to calcineuropathy from the high light chain burden. Um, so I might also do DARA cyborg vis-a-vis -vis the Andromeda study, for example, which was done for amyloid patients. So um, initially, as you're waiting for that LEN, get that um, 
myeloma burden down, and then you can actually pick the right dose of lead because sometimes your clearance will improve within one month, and the dose of lead you might order might very well change. But um, let's see if we get our audience selection responses. <coughs> okay, dude, this was your case. What are your thoughts on? So my choice would be, again, the DRD is, is great. I, I see 49% of the people using DRD. So one of the caveats that I, I, I really said was like, because we said it's, it's a transplant ineligible patient. So looks like the options are move towards a data plus RD. The question that I always have is, why is this patient a transplant ineligible patient? So I can't see a clear reason why in, in the case. So my choice would be if I can use those photo regimens, get the disease comorbidity down, if the patient has multiple compression fractures, and you're able to get the disease comorbidity down and, and bring the performance status up, and this patient is ready for a transplant, if you can make the transplant eligible, that would be the, that would be the goal of the treatment. You're benefiting the patient there. So you're in the camp of if they're breathing, they're transplant eligible. Karina, are you in the same camp? I mean, I'm from MD Anderson, so, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I agree. I think you have to make sure if someone's really transplant eligible or not. If there's a 74-year-old that looks like a 60-year-old, I think potentially worthwhile. If there's a 74-year-old that even on paper looks great, but they're coming in shuffling gait or something's just not right, it's not myeloma related, we have Daryl and Dex. I mean, it's such a great option. It's amazing responses for so long, over five years, right? And then down the road, hopefully, we'll have other drugs that we can give. So it's really that risk of that transplant mortality and quality of life that I think each individual patient in that 75, you know, around that age really matters. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in between you guys. I mean, I, th I think you need to be a little bit more than breathing, but I, I don't think you need to make a decision at day one is my other point, right? Because I think you can divide patients into two categories. If you get induction therapy and after three to four cycles, you have deep, profound remission and excellent tolerance, I'm not sure what I'm going to gain for an older patient to be going through MEL, which we often would reduce for safety as well, right? So until we have a study that shows DRD, say, versus MEL140 and gives us a clear answer, we have a little bit of a data penia here, right? And I think in that setting of data penia, I think the patient experience matters a lot. So if you have a profound response and tolerance is great, I, it's hard to beat a PFS of more than five years. I mean, in OS, it's not, median PFS hasn't been reached right. at five years. That's even better than most transplant data with 200, right? Now 200 LEN maintenance. So I think, on the other hand, if you're not having good response and you're having terrible rashes and cytopenias and intolerance, then absolutely, that may be. So I, again, I think in similarly to the first part, B versus K, if you have neuropathy, you can switch. Here, if you don't get a profound remission, you can also still collect. I think, but the point is, I think these patients should be probably referred to transplant centers if, especially after that, say, third month, you're not getting that great response, have a, have a look-see and see if it's worth it. Um, and I think since we're a little bit short on time, um, I'll, let's let's throw this to Dr. Patel. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna do all of relapse refractory myeloma in 10 minutes. Ready? <laughs> I'm channeling my friend Tornina Shaw right now. <laughs> um, all right. So I think Dr. Uh, Chari already did a great job of sort of discussing a little bit about um, you know our early lines of therapy. The one thing I want to add, I, I do think in the myeloma community. We are hopefully eventually going to get rid of prior lines of therapy and go to exposures and um, refractoriness because as we're getting all these new drugs that we're talking about earlier, our patients are becoming penta-exposed and penta-refractory in you know, the third line. Um, and so right now, though, this is how it's set up in NCCN. So again, there's just a smorgasbord of all the different options you can have um, in terms of the first one to three prior lines and then others um, and I'll go a little bit into this and then I love this slide because it really has you know the things that Dr. Chari had available like Ben Domustine when he was a fellow and then <laughs> the newer things that have come in um, in the last you know a couple of years um, in that last four prior therapies and the way I'd like to actually see this is probably putting some of those earlier than before we use those alkylators well which I'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, so this is a, a slide I stole from Tom Martin um, and added my little purple dashed line. Um, and I think this is in an ideal world, right? So with these new CAR Ts and bispecifics that we're getting that have these amazing, you know, response rates and PFS, we are adding life, like quality and quantity of life for these patients almost two to four years. 
um, the question is access. And so that's really where we need to do a better job so that mo more patients can get it. Okay, so lines two to four, early relapse. Um, this is also Dr. Shahari's slide, that just in a different way from what he presented. Um, and just a lot of data, but I think just goes into saying you know, why we can't compare trials uh, when they're not compared directly in phase three trials. Um, there's different patient pop, you know, populations in terms of median lines of therapy, high risk disease, you know, um, these patients who had different types of um, um, starting points. But again, we have these amazing therapy options out there. So palm-based, car-based, usually in the second, third line. This is what I'm using um, with the CD38. So Derek Cardex, usually for my patients, especially if they're high risk. Um, but of course, prior therapy, as well as if they're refractory to both Len and Dara, um, or car, if they're on car for high risk, um, maintenance, all of that sort of takes, um, you know, some decision making. And then really looking at, you know, sort of some of the other combinations, especially for patients, let's say, who couldn't do CAR. So PVD um, in that, you know, uh, situation, um, or our board has a med instead of CAR because we, you know, someone has um, multiple clots already or they have heart failure that we can't use it right away. Um, so just other options. And, and here we, we start getting the cell and next door um, based regimens as well. So just, again, great hazard ratios and triplet better than double it, um, which we know. Um, and again, we throw some thalidomide in there with VTD, but um, PI, image, X, triplet, um, you know, again, we can use different uh, versions. So car palm decks at the bottom, um, again, I tend to use a lot in my high risk patients earlier. All right, and the only thing I'm gonna say about this is coming back to that Len resistance, right? So I rarely ever use Len again um, right after, maybe, fifth, sixth line when I'm running out of options and I'm trying to put things together, um, or someone really just tolerated it much better than other therapies. But I think when someone's refractory, we have so many other options, we really should be uh, changing um, potentially class too, right? I, I don't necessarily change class for everybody. I don't think we have as much data for every single patient, but I, I do think we could talk about that with a discussion. And then I think the, the venetoclax story, right? So for those patients with 1114 translocation in myeloma, which is about 20% of patients, um, you know, we have um, venetoclax. So because of the high BCL2 um, that 1114 patients have, um, maybe our first biomarker that we finally have um, for, for myeloma, um, and hopefully future, we'll have other uh, ways to treat patients with specific uh, translocations. But again, targeting 1114 patients, we saw not just this PFS response, but a survival benefit. Um, again, when, these, when, when the trial was done and we had everybody on that trial, all myeloma patients, we actually had um, a survival that was poor, right? It was, it was actually less than the... Um, um, Bortezum of Dex arm. And so, again, really important for us to be able to find these biomarkers so we can move forward with appropriate therapy for patients. Okay, so this is where I want to spend most of my time. Um, the later lines of relapse, right? Lines four plus. Um, so, again, coming back to the cell and extra based regimens, um, we have a few. So, we have Celly Dex. Um, uh, bortezomib, Celidex, Palm, um, and then with Dara. And I think the biggest lesson, I mean, we have uh, Dr. Chari here, who was the first person I emailed when I didn't know what to do with Sally, um, so he can answer all those types of questions. But really, going to once a week instead of twice a week, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's definitely much harder to um, tolerate when you're, we're doing it twice a week for patients, um, especially in that relapsed refractory setting where they have lots of other um, issues already going in. But again, these are patients that were pent refractory, um, you know, in the original studies and still had, um, you know, close to a 30% response rate, uh, 26%. So some kind of option uh, towards the end. Um, managing the GI toxicities. Uh, Dr. Chari sent me this great slide that helped me take care of my patients, but really knowing that the nausea, especially the first cycle, um, the dose reduction helps, but using two antiemetics, including a 5-H3 um, antagonist, and then really bringing these patients in for fluids if they need it, um, salt tablets sometimes, anti-diarrhea uh, medications as well. So they do need a little bit of hand-holding, um, especially if they're frail uh, when you first start. All right, so the BCMA directive therapies. Um, this is my favorite part. So four plus prior lines of therapy is where it's approved which makes it a little bit difficult, but um, we have three different mechanisms of action so far. So the ADC, the antibody drug conjugate um, uh, blantamab, 
um, you know, as a single agent was approved and recently was withdrawn from the market because of the phase three study um, not showing superiority. Um, I do think that, you know, there are patients currently on that are responding, so those patients will keep going with it. And I'm hoping in the future with some of the um, combination trials we'll see it come back because there's definitely patients that, that do respond to it and that can't get some of these other therapies either. Um, so we'll, we'll get more of that in the future. Um, but then CAR-T, so um, two CAR-Ts that we have approved now for myeloma, idacaptogene viclusol and uh, sulpicaptogene autolusol. Um, and then the bispecific teclistamab that was just approved um, a few weeks ago. So the one thing I'll say with the balantamab, you know, because again, there's some patients on it and more might be coming on, on in the future, really just making sure ophthalmology is, is partnering with you, right? Um, with the combinations, I think going to every eight weeks or six weeks or even longer than that, um, they, they won't have to um, see the ophthalmologist as much, um, which will help as well. Okay. So another table, um, which I'm not going to go into detail with, but again, um, just looking at all CAR T cell um, that are available and other ones that are um, coming down the road. So Ida cell, um, really, you know, these are the first patient. This is the first trial with CAR T we did in myeloma, um, and 73% response rate for all patients at the highest or the dose of 450 million cells, which is what we use in standard of care, aim for it was 84%. Um, and PFS 8.8, .8, but again, for that full dose level, it was about a year of PFS. Um, and the survival, you know, again, these patients are really relapsed refractory, and anyone who gets these novel therapies, we've seen that all of a sudden their overall, overall survival is improved, even if they're not a cure yet, which, you know, hopefully we're going to get there one day. And then we had Siltacel, and again, everyone's heard the 98% response rate, you know, 80% CR rate, um, and we haven't reached a um, uh, median PFS um, yet. There's another um, study with CAR-T DDBCMA. This is using a different, um, rather than an STFD um, for that BCMA, and just has had some amazing response rates again, 100%, um, you know, 85% MRD negative, um, and um, hopefully that, that group is starting to their phase soon. And when we don't have CAR-T and we don't have enough, this is why I think it's so important to make sure we're, we're really looking at all of these things um, for the future. A lot of people say there's too many BCMA therapies, uh, <laughs> we just have to be smart in how we do it, right? Um, and then the ALO 715. So, you know, again, the biggest issue is getting a slot, keeping patients in control, control while you're waiting for the manufacturing, and then eventually getting it. So can you do an off-the-shelf? Um, so, again, some great data so far, but a little bit early uh, for us. And then in terms of safety, I will just say that compared to lymphoma, um, it's probably a little bit easier in terms of CRS and, and less ICANs that we, we see with lymphoma patients in CAR-T, but you still have a little bit, so these patients do need to be monitored uh, relatively closely. And infections for our relapse refractory fifth-line plus patients, both the CAR-Ts and the bispecifics, infections is really the main thing we have to look for. So making sure you're partnering with um, folks who have been doing this to say what, you know, if someone does have an infection, what should I look for? Because they're not the typical infections necessarily. Um, we're seeing viral infections and, and um, other things that we wouldn't necessarily see before. Um, I won't go into detail about this, but at least you have the slide. Um, and again, coming back to the infections, so just one paper from UCSF that showed that, you know, overall, um, these are all CAR-T patients, um, thankfully not, not all fatal infections, but you, you need to find these things. So CMV, adenovirus, um, you know, a couple of patients with fungal, but making sure we're looking for this in these really immunocompromised patients. And then coming to the BCMA by specifics, so again, you know, off the shelf, you're, re you're um, um, taking your T cells and, and you know, basically um, going after the uh, myeloma together with it. And 63% response rate in relapse refractory, um, I think is pretty phenomenal, PFS of 11.3 months. Um, again, much, much higher than anything else we've ever seen as a single agent getting approved. Um, so the other ones in development, um, Elrinatumab, um, sub-Q weekly, and then we have the um, Regeneron, but I can't say, um, Alnatumab, uh, uh, the, uh, the AVD383, and the HPN217. So again, I think right now the data is too early for really to say which one's better, what's going on, but I think the administration piece, because we talk about patient ease, um, and, and that might make a difference in the future with um, how these go through forward. So. Again, great, great opportunities um, to improve care for myeloma patients. Coming back to the immunodeficiency and infection, but with bispecifics. So again, 
there is a risk because there's continued therapy here, um, unlike a one and done, um, you're engaging T cells that otherwise would be doing surveillance. Um, so you, you have risk of infections there. Patients actually do get neutropenic. A lot of people think, oh, there's no LD chemo, so with bispecifics you don't. We've seen some um, uh, severe neutropenia. Um, and making sure that hypogamma globulinemia, that's the other big thing with DCMA directed therapies that we see, so really important. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the sequencing, but I have some um, slides here. Just, again, we don't see complete loss of BCMA as much as we do with CD19 therapies. Um, so there's probably some dimming and some things that happen, and hopefully, you know, we'll have more answers in the future about it. Um, but we have seen some, you know, decrease in response rates, and this is just some of the real-world data um, that was presented for um, IDASL that you can get good response rates. It's about 10% less for most of the studies that you look at. Um, but sometimes the PFS is lower, so we still need to learn about bispecifics, CAR T's, can you put them right after each other, which direction, uh, but in general, we still see the highest response rates for BCMA therapy after another BCMA therapy, right? So I still think they're, they're viable, it's just we need to learn how to um, go forward with that. And so um, there are a few trials with um, Filtosol that have looked at this too. Um, I think cohort C is being presented, updated um, at this meeting. There's quite a few um, trials that are being updated at this meeting that will look at this. Um, but again, after CAR-T, um, this is UCSF data again, that further BCMA-specific therapies between the bispecific and ABC actually had some of the, the, the better response rates, um, especially the bispecific. All right. So again, other studies that do show um, sequencing um, and response rates are still relatively good, about 10% less than what they would see in naive patients. Um, um, but again, we, I think we still need the duration of treatment for most of these to know what to do next. And again, data for tocilizumab after prior BCMA. All right, oh, I almost caught us up. Um, so conclusions, you know, I still think there's populations with unmet needs, and hopefully moving some of these therapies earlier will change this. Um, but inadequate access to care, high-risk disease, leukemia, plasma cell leukemia, patients who have really aggressive disease, I can't get them to some of these novel therapies patients with CNS involvement in frail patients, and, and really the take-home points, triplets, better than doublets. Um, goal is treat before clinical decline, if we can, and that's a whole other topic we can talk about at other, other times. But optimize survival, safety, and quality of life, um, and really these new therapeutic targets are creating exponential hope um, and combination sequencing options that we need to further elucidate, hopefully with biomarkers. Okay, so then we'll go to our I have one case, but we're going to go through um, the, the evolution of myeloma treatment with this patient. So 67-year-old white man diagnosed with ISS stage 1 IgG kappa standard risk myeloma four years ago. Um, so a little bit younger than average age at diagnosis, um, but standard risk anemia of 9.4 and had three isolated lytic lesions, but otherwise healthy and fit. Um, and ends up getting VRD induction, high dose melphalan with transplant, lung maintenance for about three and a half years. Best response was VGPR, but now he's having this slow biochemical progression with um, an M protein that was zero and, or 0.1, let's say, and then now it's 0.5. Um, Kappa light chains are 55, ratio 15. His hemoglobin is still okay this time, 12.3. He doesn't have new lytic lesions, so no crab. Um, he's first relapsed, refractory to lung. Right? So, for the audience, how would you treat this patient in first relapse, standard risk disease? Because we're waiting for the answer, one of the questions that just came in. Oh, oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, so let's see, Dara or Isa with Cardex. Dara or Isa with Pondex. All right, what, do you, what would you guys do? Before, I just want to add that this yeah, is really important. Question. Do you need to treat a first relapse? So that's the first question. Ah. So is it wait, reasonable to watch and wait before you even jump into that? I think that's going on in my mind as well. So just because somebody hits the numbers, 
doesn't mean that the patient needs to be treated. Absolutely, these patients could be monitored. We all have patients in our, in, in our group, like what's the doubling time? Like is it over two years, going from 0.5 to 1. They're officially off the clinical trial if they, if they meet the criteria of progression, but they still can get that clinical benefit. I, I tell the patients, when you're in a regimen, you want to get squeeze all the benefit that you can get the regimen before you, you throw off the regimen because the likelihood is we're never going to use the regimen before. So that's my view. Do you have any? Yeah, I think basically I agree with that, but it's hard when you have patients that are, because myeloma is not one disease, right? So if you have high-risk patients versus those really, really standard risk patients, in my high-risk patients, I see it go to point two. I'm like, oh gosh, what's going to happen, right? Everything's going to fall apart. Um, and then there's all the people in between. So I do think we need a better, better biomarker to really parse these patients out because I don't want to miss something either, right? I don't want to miss renal failure and someone's on dialysis now or they get a fracture and now their quality of life has gone down. So I agree with you, but I think we, we just need better ways to see how to do that. Yeah, I think probably the crab symptoms would clearly warrant therapy. I think we all agree. But key to that is you actually have to look at the bones, right? So exactly. you can't just say that, oh, patient has no bone pain. What if they have um, new lesions? And then extra medullary and high risk. But back to you. So what, what uh, you guys were going to say, that this patient who's blend refractory after first relapse. So I want to make a comment before I jump on to asking the question. So there's a very important uh, abstract that I've been really wanting to see. This is the MRC myeloma 11 topic, asking the same exact question about what do you call refractoriness? Clearly, I would call this patient refractory, but probably that, 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 we, that probably will help me more to understand. So going on to the audience has chosen the right two regimens that I would choose, Dara, with, Dara Rx, ESA with CAR, Dara Rx, ESA with, with POM. So in patients who have transportation issues, in patients who, who I can bring them on a, on a weekly basis, I probably use the POM-based approach. And these have shown to be superior even among patients who are land refractory. So the card-based approach is probably for those patients, I would, I would, they're high risk, they've clearly demonstrated that they're progressing pretty rapidly. And those patients that live very close by and they want to come by can prove that they're tolerating. Great. I think we're going to take this case and make it, tweak it. Okay, so what if the patient had had a CD38-based induction? What would you do now? Are you clean that and you want to take this one? Sure. If I stopped the CD38 and they had three and a half years, I could potentially go back to it, right? And again, it, 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 there's so many questions that go through my mind when I see that patient. But um, this is where I will go to a car-based regimen. If they got, let's say, DVRD, um, I can switch to, you know, car POM, car, try to stay away from alkylators, but, you know, again, car cytoxin. Um, when someone's this slowly relapsing and they're not high risk, I would probably stick to more of the car palm um, or even elo palm sometimes here. Um, again, depending on if they had that DARA throughout or not. I think this brings up, um, it's interesting, it probably for the typical patient, we're going to have more transplant ineligible patients being CD38 refractory first relapse than transplant eligible based on what we talked about earlier. The Griffin is fixed duration, Cassiopeia has this weird double randomization. So until that death settles, the typical older patient, transplant ineligible, might be more CD38 refractory. So one of the questions coming, there's several flavors of this, which is, um, is there a role for ELO after DARA? Is there a role for ESA after DARA? Can you use these uh, monoclonals one after another? Thoughts? So in my opinion, ESA is no different than, than DARA. DARA is no different than ESA. These are, these are both targeting CD38. They could be different epitopes, but there is no clinical data showing that one is beneficial over the other in somebody refracting to, to one or the other. So I, I don't buy that argument like ESA is, can be a salvage regimen after that or vice versa. ELO2 SMAB, it's a very different target. We all understand that it does not have single agent activity. What is the right partner that we want to go with? So if somebody is progressing on data KD, absolutely, ELO palm backs where we have data, absolutely could be a salvage regimen that I want to consider. But vice versa probably not, not be true. So I think it makes more sense to look at choosing a regimen. What is, what is that I'm losing 
when I'm choosing the next line of treatment or the following lines of treatment, and that should be all taken into consideration before you choose a regimen at, at any given point. So high risk, things, how do you change your approach? Anything different? Yeah, and especially today. So four years ago when that patient was diagnosed, I, I probably would have done KRD, um, despite you know, having that discussion earlier, because um, they are a fit patient. They don't have major um, potential side effects that I can think of. Um, and then they would have gotten probably KR or something, you know, as a doublet. Um, so the likelihood is that they'd be both um, um, refractory to PI and. Um, so again, it's going back to a DARA base then because they haven't had it yet. Um, and if they've had K, I'd probably change to K or POM again, depending on what they've had, right? Yeah. Um, and what they're refractory to. I think if, if someone changes to high risk, let's say this patient was not high risk, and now it relapsed, we've done the bone marrow and it shows 17P all of a sudden or something crazy is happening, um, then I'm throwing all my best drugs, you know, um, DKD, IKD, um, CD38 with a PI. Just to clarify, I love carfilzomib as a drug. I just want some evidence to move it to front line, right? So I think it is an outstanding drug, and we have studies showing PFS and OS benefits for it in the relapse setting for sure. Uh, I, I don't see the role of bortezomib in the relapse setting, right, because you have a better drug. Uh, but I think what, what we're, probably what you guys are both alluding to is we have four dance partners, right, CD38, IMID, uh, PI, and the one partner we didn't talk about is poor little cyclophosphamide, right? Cheap, very effective, but also can be mixed into this um, dance party, right, depending on which triplet you want to use. Um, so let's then go to your second case, unless you guys have any comments uh, in the money to do. Yep. So there's only one comment that I have when, when somebody with high-risk cytogenetics, I want to move them to the most effective treatment as early as possible. So if, if I have the access to a CAR T, or if I can see that available, I want to line them towards that. So you, know, you read one of the people's minds because they had a patient who got um, induction, trans, uh, it had induction, had a transplant relapse within a year, and there, got there upon death. And the question is, what would you do? I think we would all agree, try to get this person on the study, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 And we have some of that. Yeah. I was going to say, we have some of those studies that are being presented, um, you know, this, this meeting um, with Karma 2 and the Carta 2, the early relapse patient. So hopefully we'll have data um, to kind of show that too. That's the patient that we, we would have trouble because you have to meet the indication of the lines of therapy. And that patient clearly received only two lines of therapy. Exactly. How to navigate this person to the most effective treatment at the earliest possible remains a challenge. And each of us have, have our tricks up the sleeve of what, what to do. Right. These are the <laughs> line of therapy. Right. They don't get to fourth, fifth line, right? So these awesome therapies, the trials definitely are the way to do it otherwise. Perfect. Okay. So then the patient was actually treated with DVD. Um, they didn't want to come in for IVs. We'll just say that's why. Um, and then relapses for a second time. Um, so had a stringent CR, actually. Uh, maintained remission for three years, but now has worsening bone pain. Imaging does reveal a neolytic lesion in the humerus and femur without significant cortical thickening. So not, not at risk for fracture, but new lesions. Um, M protein is one. So second relapse, now triple class refractory. What do we do? So, audience, how would you treat this patient for a second relapse after receiving BRD and DVD in prior lines? Carpon Dax, that's the winner. 58. Wow. Um, we got some cyclos. Do you use cyclophosphamide in there? What do you guys think? What would you use? Uh, a J with a Y? 
<laughs> so my choice would be card Pomlex as well. And there are certain scenarios where I probably might choose card Sai. Say, for example, somebody in, in renal failure, somebody on dialysis. So those are the scenarios I, I would use. There are scenarios where I would avoid using that cyclophosphamide. If this is a patient where I'm lining up to receive a card P six months down the line, probably avoid that cyclophosphamide exposure all the way until the time to have an effective T cell collection. This is actually part of a broader question. Are there therapies to avoid um, in general if you're thinking about a T cell redirection coming up? The one specific question being brought up is transplant, but she always yeah. salivates when I say the word CAR-T, so okay. I need to go first. Um, so I, alpha layers, I think it, it probably does matter how long um, the time from that was. So I, I don't think you would say no to transplant in consolidation or in, in second relapse, right? Because if it's, if it's going to benefit them, that you do that. Um, but I do think trying to do a CAR-T, let's say three months after a transplant, that would be really difficult. Um, again, those T cells, with just manufacturing for CAR T, by specifics, I don't have as much data that I know of those, those types of patients because usually the trials require a little bit longer um, washout. But I will say that the patients who are on alkylators long term, like if they're on CAR Cybex for a year right before we try to manufacture, that's where I see trouble, right? Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it, I try to use cy cyclophosphamide actually in the third line now so that the fourth line, I can do something different to give them that washout from that alkylator to get them to that fifth line. But I think we've also seen some preliminary data that that old school drug, Benda, definitely is oh, not a good idea, right? That's probably one of the worst exactly. things to do in somebody going to T-cell redirection. But, um, so let's, I think, tweak your face. Oops, go back one. 11.14, how would that have changed things? So, I, I think going back to the Bellini trial, so, as Karina has clearly showed, Bellini trial is an example of how we should not do the trials. So involving all the patients when you have a real good biomarker. So I think if you're looking specifically at the patients with translocation 1114, Chaji has clearly showed, showed that these patients tend to have PFS benefit with a hazard ratio of 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So that benefit you cannot replicate anywhere else. So my choice in this patient would be using venetoclax and dexamethasone. There is more and more data with combination of PIs, more and more data with combination of CD38 antibodies. So if there's an opportunity for me to add more, so I would certainly do that. I would just tweak maybe a, a one thing, though, is that I think response rate are important to look at. MRD negativity is important to look at. PFS, but I think we can't. OS, well, we, our earlier discussion, it shouldn't be the primary endpoint because it takes forever. But I think there's a difference in looking for an OS benefit versus OS harm. I think we should always be looking for OS harm. And what's unique about Benita class, the Bellini study, is there was a response benefit. There was a PFS benefit. It was the OS harm, which, um, and I think that leads to one of the questions, which is how do you decrease harm? How are we decreasing infections? You brought this up earlier, whether Bellini is probably a little bit different, but the broader question is, uh, it's a tragic case to have a myeloma patient who's in remission die of an infection, right? So what can we do to prevent that? So I take the examples of my other hematological malignancy colleagues. So venetoclax is not a bad drug if you, if you want, if you know how to use it right. Our leukemia patients who are more immunosuppressed receive venetoclax on a, on a regular basis. So Understanding that antibiotic prophylaxis, understanding what to look for from an infectious standpoint, absolutely is crucial, especially when, you, when, you, when we have patients that are highly immunodeficient. And maybe we, when we'll talk about bispecifics, um, we can talk about that too. But um, the, how early would you use uh, Benita class in 1114 patients? Because at this point, I think your patient had been coming along multiple lines. But, Right. I mean, the earliest I've used it is probably second line. Um, but again, it, it, can I get it? Because it's compassionate use, sort of, right? Right now, maybe we have it for leukemia, so we can get it. But um, the earlier I could use it, the better. But I would still want to do it with combination. So again, it's making sure I can do that safely with the data that we have. When would you first? We have used in the very early line setting. So I think we're an institute where we have the luxury and the liberty of having a lot of basic science support. Larry Boyce has helped us clearly identify what, what it really means by having 
the translocation 1114 and and we started using Venetic flags almost like six seven years ago and clearly were able to see those benefits so we're early adapters than the late adapters. I mean I, I would just add that the hazard ratio for Bellini which is uh, you know point 0.1 is the most impressive of anything we've seen for, for 1114 I'm being specifically right so I think that's even better than CD38 monoclonal antibody so I agree I, I, I would use it as early as I could get it um, because of the unprecedented benefit. You want to just take us briefly yep. through the second case? Please? So then the patient gets uh, car Cybex for second relapse and then EPD at next line now in fourth relapse um, has still um, uh, standard risk disease so is referred to myeloma specialist for CAR T and placed on a waiting list and no information on when the slot will be available. This is the story of my life. Okay, how would you treat this patient while awaiting CAR-T therapy for the audience? This is a test of the Extra base therapy. Uh, we got some people saying bendamustine. What do you think about that, Dr. Charney? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, a little bit of everything. Teclistamab, 26%. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think I said my statement earlier about the agenda, so it's probably not the best option. The one thing we should clarify with transplant, which is different than other alkylators, you are giving stem cells back, right? So I think we need to study that a little bit better. There's a difference between blasting somebody with melphalan or cyclophosphamide or Benda and giving no stem cell support. Uh, I think that we would all be trepidatious about. But um, this is actually one of the interesting, this, the teclistamab answer comes up with a lot of this as well. So uh, do we, what do we think about, and you've alluded to this, Karina, so we'll start with you. Um, the, you know, one C word is cure, we don't talk about the other one is S, sequencing. Right. So how do you sequence, you mentioned the three different modalities of BCMA, but in particular since the Lanthanum came off market, right. the teclistamab versus CAR-T sequencing thought. Yeah, I, I don't think we have all the data to say 100%, but my inkling is if I had all access in the world also, this would be different, but I would, I would if I'm going to do CAR-T for a patient, I would like to do that first and then and then until we know timing wise because um, it's not just the expression of BCMA but it's the T cell health I and mean, manufacturing so many things affect it just like, like cyclophosphamide can um, and the data we've seen the PFS is what I worry a little bit more about that it drops um, with the CAR T which is more high maintenance to, to get it right um, but when I don't have access we have about 20% of patients dying on that CAR-T list. That, that's the patient population I'm, I'm grabbing the teclistamab for. I want them to get something. So I think it's going to evolve over the next few years, but um, my, my high-risk patients that can't make it through CAR-T, I'm going to teclistamab. That's a very practical question because you start somebody as a bridging therapy to take somebody for a transplant and they're getting such a great, res great response. Now, do you take them for a, for a CAR T or, or, or not has, has been the biggest challenge for us as well. So in terms of sequencing, the one thing that I feel is, so if somebody is going in for a CAR T, absolutely fine to move for a CAR T, there's a, there's a gap of treatment at this point of time, and you're clearly exposing those to a BCMA exposed treatment down the line. And we have more data in this aspect than, than vice versa. So more patients on teclismab, they're progressing after weekly dosing or bi-weekly dosing, and we don't have as much data to show what, what the CAR-T targeting BCMA on somebody who's progressing an ongoing BCMA therapy is able to afford. We have more data for belantumab, but, but it's not uh, available right now. I think that's a really important point. Up till now, most T-cell redirections have excluded other prior T-cell redirections of that same antigen. So mm -hmm. it's worth mentioning, we do fortunately have other targets. So GPRC5D and FCRH5. So the future looks really exciting. We don't have to be keep pummeling patients with anti-BCMA therapies. We may be able to sequence um, and alternate 
Um, but I think the, the key couple of things to just mention would be there's a difference between a CAR-T and an ADC and a bispecific DCMA in terms of the antigenic you know, um, targeting because CAR-T is a one and done and ADC by definition had very sporadic dosing. When you come in repeatedly, week after week, month after month with a BCMA bispecific, I personally think that's going to have different downstream sequelae. And you saw that in some of your graphs where if you have a prior BCMA bispecific, it goes way down. And some of the other unanswered questions is if you are giving a BCMA bispecific such as teclosumab, when do you collect for CAR-T? Because they can often get very lymphopenic because all the T cells are being marginated to the myeloma area. When do you collect um, and when do you, when do you actually do it? Um, and then the last point is I, I think we have to distinguish who these patients are, right? The patient who is going for a bispecific, I mean, we, we are all having these patients who are not getting through the whole CAR-T process. Not only do you have to get a slot, the manufacturing has to meet specifications, and by that time this disease is just blowing along. And I, I've, I think recently started to come to the point where these really rapidly progressing patients, I said, you know what, well, let's not even try CAR-T, it's not going to be feasible we need to go to a bispecific, right? So I think we kind of are asking these questions in the way that the same patient's going to get both, but the reality is the rapidly explosive patients never got to a CAR-T clinical trial, and that's one of the big constraints of the patient selection for CAR-T. It, it, you have these amazing responses, but there's also the amazing cherry-picking of patients, right? So I think um, that's a real-world pragmatic issue. The, uh, one of the other questions that comes here and uh, is how do you compare these CAR-T studies in early relapse versus the BKD, ESA-KD? So, I'll take the shot. We will have more of those answers when we have the CARMA-3 results that are, that are published, and that definitely will, will help answer the question. We got a little high-level press release on that, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's a positive study. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that was uh, nice to see. Okay, um, and I think the only other thing I think it's really important we probably should discuss is because of the tremendous, uh, maybe you could give us a clean you brought this up, a sense of the infectious issues that we're talking about with the BCMA. Are these just UTIs that require an IV antibiotic? What, are we, what kind of infections are you talking about? Yeah, I wish. Um, I talk to my ID doctors all the time now. Um, so it's almost like what we saw post allo transplants a long time ago. I will say that when we were getting patients to 5th, 6th, 7th line, even with CD38, we were seeing some of these infections, but with the BCMA knockout, I mean, again, you have T cell, you're knocking out your T cells, you're knocking out your B cells and the hypogamma and, and plasma cells, the hypogamma, and then you're also getting neutropenia, right? So it's all three. So we are being very aggressive with IVIG as needed, with, um, you know, GCSF, um, and then prophylaxis. So there, there's going to be hopefully papers coming out soon about how to do prophylaxis. For CAR-T, it's much more um, regimented, and we know. For bispecifics, it's, it's a new world, and I think we're going to have to learn timing, how long we have to do that, all that, but we still need to monitor all those. And the second a patient of mine has a fever or has symptoms of infection, we bring them in. Um, if they're doing okay, I'll get them to, let's say, ID or pulmonary to help figure out. I check in Texas, CMV is a big deal, so I check CMV on all my patients the second I think they have any kind of infection. 30% um, of our CAR-T patients end up with CMV reactivation. You know, what to do with that? We're, we're all trying to figure it out. But you have to really take all these things seriously. I think that's the biggest advice I can give. Yeah, I cannot agree more. I think what we are seeing in terms of this, the viral reactivations is a gross underrepresentation again. Because the clinical trials, before we started the clinical trials, we didn't know that any of these viral reactivations are a possibility. But we started seeing them, so what, what the gap in the data is, it was not mandated in any of these trials that you need to have a baseline, baseline viral, viral levels checked and, and so on. So in the real life, you probably might be seeing way more than what you, what you saw in the... In addition to those excellent points, I would just add COVID, right? That's a huge issue. We're losing patients to COVID um, in the BCMA therapeutics, so it's important to prophylax, vaccinate, uh, do everything possible. So um, first, uh, I just want to thank my outstanding panel for their uh, discussions and just wanted to, you know, conclude with we have a lot of options, uh, a lot of considerations in terms of picking the right treatment. Uh, getting these deep, dur durable remissions is really important, particularly for those unmet needs. Our best chance, as you heard from Dr. Nuka, is frontline therapy. Pick your best drugs. What's the right endpoint is unclear. You know, PFS, 
TFS2, OS, these are challenging questions, but, um, but the thoughtful based, uh, evidence-based use of triplets and quads and uh, these really unprecedented T-cell redirection outcomes, you know, 70 is the new 20 to 30, right? Um, meet, we really want to see how these will fare earlier in lines of therapy. And, you know, to circle back to lymphoma, I think, you know, venita class is one example. Can we get to a point where we're not going to be treating everybody the same? Individualized, prospective, risk-adapted therapies, including discontinuation for those cured patients. But um, we really want to thank the audience, both um, in live and virtually, for uh, your participation and great um, questions. And um, we're, we're happy to uh, take any questions offline afterwards. But thank you for your attendance. Thank you.